So at the very outset, let me take this opportunity to thank um, CMR University, the School of Law and its Dean, Dr. Subramanya and Professor Vidya Selvamani for your very kind invitation to be speaking to all of you here today on a topic which is very close to my heart. Um, I must admit, when I was in law school and Professor Subramanya will bear me out, he, I had the unique honor of being taught for a year by Professor Subramanya way back, you know, almost two decades ago. So um, when I got this invitation from Professor Subramanya, I uh, jumped at it. I said, um, this is something I am definitely, it's, it's, it, it'll be an honor and a privilege to be speaking as a resource person at a university, at a school of law where um, one of my former professors is now the dean and the man running the show. So I could not miss this for anything else in the world, Professor Subramanya. So I'm grateful for you having extended this invitation to me. And all the more grateful for giving me the liberty of choosing a topic of my own choice. And uh, I thought, you know, the, the legal matrix relating to international commercial arbitration is a very, very important topic which is not something that you find usually in normal textbooks. So because, you know, when you're looking at the concept of arbitration, you, arbitration is not only really restricted to the Indian Arbitration and Conciliation Act. Arbitration goes way beyond that. The Indian Arbitration and Conciliation Act to a large extent talks about the law relating to arbitration in India. But we need to understand a larger context in which uh, the Indian Arbitration Act, which is the Lex Arbitri, which it, in which it functions. And that is the reason I chose the topic that I chose for today's session. So ladies and gentlemen, on that brief introductory note, permit me to share my slides with you. Uh, Shreya, can you confirm that you can see my slides? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Excellent. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, the theme of my um, lecture today is demystifying the international commercial arbitration legal matrix. So, when we're looking at international commercial arbitration, the first thing that we need to do is we need to look at what is called I call the arbitration galaxy. This, according to me, is what constitutes the arbitration galaxy. Effectively, we are looking at the types of arbitration. Now, I have broadly classified arbitration into two types, domestic arbitration and international arbitration. Remember, we are going to be speaking about international commercial arbitration. So international commercial arbitration is only one type of the many types of arbitration which are there. So let's very quickly look at what are these different types of arbitration. When you're looking at domestic arbitration, domestic arbitration essentially is arbitration where the parties involved in the arbitration are from one particular country. And domestic arbitration is further subdivided into commercial arbitration, which relates to commercial matters where the subject matter of the dispute is commercial. And then you also have a genre of domestic arbitration, which is called statutory arbitration. Now statutory arbitration is arbitration which emanates from a particular statute. There are certain statutes in India like the Indian Railways Act, the Electricity Act, the MSME Act. These are all acts which prescribe arbitration as a means for resolving the disputes that arise out of the working of those particular statutes. And that is why, ladies and gentlemen, that is called statutory arbitration. And recognition for statutory arbitration is given in the Indian Arbitration and Conciliation Act itself. So statutory arbitration is also slightly unique in so far as it is many a times an arbitration where there is no privity of contract. In a usual arbitration, there is a contract 
which is the source for the jurisdiction for the arbitrator. But in a statutory arbitration, it is the statute by a deeming fiction which assumes the avatar of an arbitration agreement. So that is the, those are the two types of domestic arbitration. And when we are looking at international arbitration, ladies and gentlemen, the three types, according to me, there's international commercial arbitration, which is going to be the focus of today's presentation of mine, and the state to state arbitration and this investment treaty arbitration. Very quickly, let's look at international commercial arbitration. How is international commercial arbitration different from domestic commercial arbitration? The only difference, ladies and gentlemen, is that in international commercial arbitration, one of the parties in the arbitration is a non-domestic party. So if you're looking at the Indian context, you will have one Indian party and one non-Indian party. So that's an international commercial arbitration. Then you have state to state arbitration. State to state arbitration is usually non-commercial arbitration, which is entered into by countries with respect to say a, a border dispute or with respect to sharing of waters. A classic example of a state to state arbitration is a recently concluded arbitration between India and Pakistan better known as the Kishan Ganga arbitration arising out of an interpretation of the Indus Water Treaty entered into between India and Pakistan somewhere way back in the, in the 1960s. So India started building a dam on the Kishan Ganga River, which is a tributary of the Indus and Pakistan thought that it was a violation. India had, had violated its duties under the Indus Water Treaty and under the Indus Water Treaty, the mode of dispute resolution for resolving disputes was an arbitration under the PCA rules. And that is how, ladies and gentlemen, we had a state-to-state -state arbitration between India and Pakistan. And then lastly, we have investment treaty arbitration. I think investment treaty arbitration is something many of you and most of you are very well aware of. This again is an arbitration just like statutory arbitration, it is called an arbitration without privity because it is an arbitration initiated by a foreign investor against the government of a country in which the foreign investor has invested in. And it arises out of a breach of obligation, a treaty breach, a breach of an obligation of a treaty entered into by the host nation and the nation or the country where the investor originates. A recent case is the Vodafone BIT investment treaty arbitration where there was an award against India, the Republic of India. And a more recent one is uh, the Kane Vedanta case where again, sadly, India ended up on the losing side. So, very, very important, ladies and gentlemen, when we talk about international commercial arbitration, we need to know in the larger scheme of things, when you're looking at the arbitration galaxy, where does this type of arbitration slot in? <laughs> so we've seen types of arbitration. Also very important, ladies and gentlemen, when you're looking at types of arbitration, to look at the modes of arbitration. Many a times, a lot of us get confused between the modes of arbitration and the types of arbitration. So when you're looking at the modes of arbitration, arbitration is said to be bifocal. Bifocal because it is conducted under or through two modes. You can either have an arbitration in an ad hoc mode or you can have an arbitration in an institutional mode. Very briefly, let's look at what are these two modes of arbitration. An institutional arbitration, ladies and gentlemen, is an arbitration which is administered or which is supervised by a specialist arbitral institution like say the ICC in Paris or the Singapore International Arbitration Center or the London Court of International Arbitration. These are all specialist arbitral institutions. So when arbitration is administered by a specialist arbitration institution, 
under its own rules of arbitration. All these institutions I mentioned, ladies and gentlemen, have their own rules of procedure of how an arbitration is to be conducted under those rules. So these are the two factors which distinguishes an institutional mode of arbitration from the ad hoc mode. So the presence or absence of a specialist arbitral institution and the presence or absence of the rules of an institution are the is, is the dividing uh, line between institutional arbitration and ad hoc arbitration. So ad hoc arbitration is simply an arbitration which is not conducted or supervised under the aegis of a specialist arbitral institution and which is not run under or administered under the rules of arbitration of that specialized arbitral institution. On your screen, you have the definitions of these two types of arbitration given by or contained in two of the leading and most reputed textbooks on international arbitration, Redfern and Hunter on arbitration and Russell on arbitration. If you're looking at reference books for international commercial arbitration, ladies and gentlemen, I would say look no further than Redfern and Hunter and Russell on arbitration. These are the two go-to textbooks, more so Redfern and Hunter. I would recommend Redfern and Hunter because it is um, a, a textbook which has got something in it for everyone, right from a student, right up to a seasoned practitioner. So ladies and gentlemen, we've seen types of arbitration. We've also seen now the two modes of arbitration in which uh, the various types of arbitration are conducted in. Okay, so now let us get to the meat of the matter, which is international commercial arbitration and the legal matrix relating to international commercial arbitration. So the first thing that we need to do, ladies and gentlemen, is to define what is international commercial arbitration. What is, we know what commercial arbitration is, we need to know what is international. So international, as I alluded to earlier, is a term which is used to mark the difference between arbitrations, which are purely restricted to the national boundaries involving national parties and those which have an effect or a beyond the boundaries of a particular country and which have an international effect. So how do you decide whether an arbitration is international or not? Now, there are two bases or there are two tests on which anvil you can decide whether an arbitration is international or not. The first test, ladies and gentlemen, is what is called the nationality test, where you look at the nationality of the parties involved in the arbitration. And the second test is called the nature of the dispute test, where you look and analyze and see the what kind of a dispute is this? Is it a dispute where the focus and its ramifications go beyond the boundaries of a country or is it restricted to one country itself? So these are the two commonly used bases for deciding whether an arbitration is international or not. And when you're looking at these bases, ladies and gentlemen, I must let you know that there is a lack of an internationally agreed definition of what is international. There is no consensus around the world as to whether we should use the nationality test or whether we should use the nature of the dispute test to decide the internationality of the dispute. Every country has its own test for deciding the internationality of the arbitration. And if you were to look at India, since we are based in India, the test in India is contained in section two, subsection one, clause F of the Indian Arbitration and Conciliation Act, where we find the definition of the term international commercial arbitration. Section 21F defines international commercial arbitration, ladies and gentlemen, on the basis of nationality of the parties. When one of the 
one when the nationality of one of the parties in an arbitration is non indian then the arbitration is assumed to be an international commercial arbitration so therefore the test that we use in india ladies and gentlemen or the test used under the arbitration and conciliation act to determine the internationality of a dispute is the nationality test now let's look at the ancestral model law on arbitration more than 90 jurisdictions around the world have based their arbitration statutes on this model law drafted and crafted by ancestral which as most of you know is the legal apex legal body of the united nations system in the world or in the in in in, in the realm of international trade law ancestral stands for the united nations commission on international trade law and ancestral's model law on arbitration defines arbitration as is given on your screen so if you analyze very quickly this definition of when an arbitration is international you will find that the basis or the test which is used in the international in the ancestral model law of arbitration ladies and gentlemen is not the nationality test which is used in the indian arbitration and conciliation act but the other test which is the nature of the dispute test so so this just goes to prove my point ladies and gentlemen that there is no internationally accepted definition or basis which is universally followed by countries as to when a dispute is international and when it is not okay now we've seen what is international we've seen how we decide what is the internationality when does an arbitration become international and now ladies and gentlemen we're going to focus on the real the real deal for today's lecture which is the legal matrix of arbitration so when you're looking at arbitration ladies and gentlemen in my view there are four layers or levels of laws and rules which apply to an arbitration i'm not looking at the enforcement aspect of it so we leave that aspect of it aside when you're looking at the procedure of arbitration up to an award there are three laws and one set of rules which in my view apply to this entire procedure of arbitration which i call the arbitration regime or the legal matrix of an arbitration we have the governing law of the contract which is also called proper law or the substantive law then we have the law of the arbitration seat which is also called the lex arbitrary the correct technical term or the curial law and then we have the law of the arbitration agreement and then ladies and gentlemen last but not the least we have the arbitration of the procedural rules which govern the nitty gritties of procedure in an arbitration so this is in my view what constitutes the legal matrix of arbitration and the next 60 70 minutes are going to be spent in trying to demystify this legal matrix for those of you who do not know about it this legal matrix might be a mystery for some of you might not be a mystery for some of you for those of you whom this is not a mystery you're free to leave this lecture ladies and gentlemen it might not make sense to you but for those who want to know a little more and want to demystify these concepts i'm very happy to take you through these concepts for the next 60 to 70 minutes so let's start off ladies and gentlemen with the governing law of the contract or the proper law of the contract all right so what is the governing law of the contract or the proper law of the contract the governing law of the contract ladies and gentlemen is that law which the arbitrator or the arbitral tribunal will follow to decide the substantive rights and obligations of the parties when an arbitrator is deciding a dispute an arbitrator needs to decide the dispute on the basis of a certain law so very simply the law on the basis of which an arbitrator will decide a dispute is the governing law of the contract it's a very simple concept 
So nothing, nothing, nothing really, there's no rocket science in the governing law of the contract. It's just the basis of the law on which the arbitrator will decide the dispute, will decide the substantive rights and obligations of the two parties. And this governing law of the contract, ladies and gentlemen, is either contained in a separate clause or like the clause, all you need to do when you're looking at a governing law of the contract clause is just one line in the third bullet point in red, which says the law governing the contract shall be the substantive law of, it can be India, it can be the USA, it can be UK, when it's an international commercial arbitration. In the domestic arbitration, it's debatable whether you can have a foreign law as the governing law of the contract. But when it's an international commercial arbitration, it's a given that parties have the full freedom to choose a governing law of the contract as per their own choice. So this governing law of the contract clause, ladies and gentlemen, is either contained as a separate clause in a contract or many a times it also forms um, you know, one level or one tier in the dispute resolution clause or the arbitration clause. So but it's a very important clause to have in your contract because if you do not have this clause in a contract, then there can be, you might have to spend some time in deciding as to what is the governing law of the contract intended by the parties. So when you're looking at the governing law of the contract, determining the governing law of the contract, ladies and gentlemen, the first golden general rule that applies is that parties in keeping with party autonomy. You've all heard of party autonomy. Party autonomy, in my view, is one of the fundamental principles applicable to the process of arbitration. Per this fundamental principle of party autonomy, the parties in an arbitration have the full freedom to make a choice of a legal system or law, which will be the governing law of the contract. Now, if parties do not specify um, the substantive law, the governing law of the contract in their, in, in their arbitration agreement or in the contract, it will result in a lot of time wasted. You, this, the issue of what is the governing law of the contract will either have to be decided by the courts or it'll have to be decided by the arbitral tribunal if it is already, if it's already um, you know, constituted. And, and this fundamental principle that the parties have the freedom to choose a appropriate governing law of the contract is something which is also substantiated and sanctified by section 28 of the Indian Arbitration and Conciliation Act, which says that the arbitral tribunal shall decide the dispute in accordance with the rules of law designated by the parties as applicable to the substance of the dispute. So that's what the Arbitration and Conciliation Act in India says. The ICC rules, the ICC rules um, of arbitration also give the parties the freedom to agree on a rule or the rules of law on the basis of which an arbitrator will decide. So. The first general rule, ladies and gentlemen, is that the parties have the freedom to decide what should be the governing law of the contract. Now, what happens when the parties have failed and neglected and omitted to mention the governing law of the contract when negotiating and, and finalizing the contract? So when this is not done, ladies and gentlemen, when parties have not made an express choice of a governing law of the contract. Again, the general rule is that the arbitral tribunal, the arbitrators are given the freedom to decide what is the substantive law of the contract or the governing law of the contract. And this freedom to the arbitrators to decide when the governing law of the contract is not chosen by the parties is given in section 28 subsection one, clause B sub clause three. It says the arbitral tribunal shall apply the rules of law it considers to be appropriate given all the circumstances surrounding the dispute. And again, if you were to go to look, look at the institutional mode of arbitration, ladies and gentlemen, I, I take the example of the ICC rules of arbitration. The ICC rules of arbitration, article 21.1, again say that 
in the absence of an agreement between the parties with respect to what should be the governing law of the contract, the tribunal shall apply the rules of law which it determines to be appropriate. So ultimately, the bottom line is this, that the parties have the freedom to first make a choice of the governing law of the contract and put it into the contract. If they have not agreed to a, a, a governing law of the contract in, uh, and put it in the contract, then ladies and gentlemen, the tribunal will decide, the arbitrators will decide on the basis of the facts and circumstances of the case as to which is the governing law of the contract, right? So that's, that's how you determine the governing law of the contract. And another thing, when you're looking at the basis of an arbitrator deciding a, a, you know, a dispute in arbitration, ladies and gentlemen, in addition to the governing law of the contract, if you were to look at the Arbitration and Conciliation Act, and also if you were to look at the ICC rules of arbitration, you will find that both these documents, the law and the rules, say that in addition to the governing law of the contract, when an arbitrator is deciding a dispute, the arbitrator or the tribunal should also take into account two other things. One, the terms of the contract. They cannot ignore the terms of the contract. And two, trade usages. Like for example, you know, the UCP 500 or the INCO terms, the international commercial terms, CIF, FOB, and all those terms. So terms of the contract and trade usages have also to be kept in mind when an arbitrator decides a dispute. So to briefly sum up, when an arbitrator is deciding the substantive rights and obligations of the two parties, the arbitrator will decide that on the basis of three things. One, the governing law of the contract, or the, which is also called the substantive law of the contract or the proper law of the contract. Second, terms of the contract. And three, the trade usages. It is on the basis of these three things that an arbitrator will give his decision. So this is the governing law of the contract, ladies and gentlemen. The first tier in the legal matrix relating to arbitration. Now I thought, let me just quickly share with you the results of a study conducted in 2010 by White and Case and the School of International Arbitration at Queen Mary University of London. Now, this is something very interesting for all of you all. Every two or three years, the School of International Arbitration, Queen Mary University of London, in association either with White and Case or with PWC, have been bringing out reports on various facets of arbitration. This is all available, these reports, once in two year, once in three year reports are all available on the website of the School of International Arbitration, Queen Mary. I would advise all of you to go and have a look at these uh, reports. They're very, very instructive, very, very educative reports on recent trends and how people are making the decisions that they make in arbitration and especially international commercial arbitration. So coming back to this 2010 report, uh, which was called Choices in International Arbitration, ladies and gentlemen. One question which was put to the respondents in this, uh, you know, when putting together this report was, what were the top influences on the choice of law governing the substantive, governing the substance of the dispute? So effectively, the respondents were asked as to when you are making a choice of the governing law of the contract, or the substantive law of the contract, on what basis are you making the choice of a particular law? So if you're choosing English law, you're choosing Indian law, Singaporean law, on what basis are you doing making that, exercising that choice? So this study and these results, I think are very instructive. It gives you an idea into on what basis are these decisions being made? Let's quickly look at a few of these, uh, you know, influences. Neutrality and impartiality of the legal system, 66%. And that's perhaps the reason why you find English law is one of the most commonly used substantive law of the contracts for international, uh, for international contracts. Appropriateness for type of contract, familiarity with and experience of that particular law, 
choice of law imposed by the other party very important choice of law imposed by the other party because this also is reflective of a situation in arbitration you know remember when you're negotiating a contract many a times parties are not don't have the same bargaining position many a times the choice of a governing law of a contract and the choice of other commercial terms are imposed upon the party who is in a weaker bargaining position by the party who is in a stronger bargaining position and that's usually how it is many a times in 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 uh, in these contracts corporate policies standard terms and conditions place of performance of the contract location of company headquarters and 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 these ladies and gentlemen are illustrative of the basis on which this important clause or this important choice of law is exercised now this is a very important question ladies and gentlemen can you have a floating governing law of the contract clause now this is something which came up it's a it's a shipping related case it relates to the ship on your on your screen if you were to magnify and 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 squeeze your eyes you will see that it's a, the name of the vessel is called the iran wajdan and in this case ladies and gentlemen the contract said the contract of carriage shall in the option of the carrier to be declared by him on the merchant's request be governed either by iranian law or by german law or by english law with the exclusive jurisdiction of the courts in london so you see here there is there is there is there is no choice of one particular jurisdiction as um, whose law will apply as the governing law of the contract there is iranian law there is german law and there is english law this is what is called a floating clause there is a floating governing law of the contract it floats at the option of the merchant iranian law to german law or english law so are these clauses valid that is because are they really valid one argument is that these are slightly uncertain clauses so here is what the english courts held it's not an indian case it's a case from the high court of england and wales the court said that such floating governing law of the contract clauses are invalid so you cannot have floating clauses you cannot have multiple laws to be the governing law of your contract so that's one interesting case which i wanted to share with you where you had a floating clause so when you're drafting contracts ladies and gentlemen when ma many of you graduate and go and become lawyers especially transactional lawyers stay away from such clauses remember governing you when you are choosing a governing law choose just one jurisdiction don't be overly creative and um, you know and an extra smart by trying to have multiple uh, multiple multiple laws then another question arises can you avoid reference to a national law as the governing law of the contract we've been talking about english law indian law singaporean law to be uh, you know to be chosen as the governing law of the contract can you choose a law which is not a national law well the short answer to that is yes this again goes back to the fundamental policy the fundamental principle of arbitration party autonomy party autonomy has given the parties or this this rule of party autonomy and and the ability to go beyond the national law is embodied in most national legislations in a concept which is called ex equo et bono or amiable compositio so what what do these be, terms mean ex equo et bono is a latin term which means what is fair and just amiable compositio is a french term which means um a friendly arbitrator so these terms are usually used synonymously and basically these terms effectively mean that you can the arbitrator can decide a dispute 
not on the basis of a law of a particular country the contract law of a particular country but you can do so on the basis of what is fair what is just and what is equitable given the facts and circumstances of each case so here in and and this is what distinguishes arbitration ladies and gentlemen in a way it is one of the distinguishing characteristics of arbitration because here the arbitrator has the ability to decide not on the basis of the technicality of a particular governing law of the contract but on the basis of what he thinks is fair and just and equitable in the given circumstances of a case but you must remember ladies and gentlemen an arbitrator an arbitrator can act ex equo ad bono only with the consent of the parties if the parties parties um uh, have to just give me a minute parties have to consent to the arbitrators being uh, having the ability to decide on the basis of what is fair what is just and what is equitable okay if the parties do not agree then such a power can cannot such a power cannot be exercised by the arbitrators okay so next question ladies and gentlemen next interesting aspect what we would want to look at is i am having slight difficulty with my computer okay this is something i wanted to share with you i talked about justice i talked about equity conscience good conscience i just wanted to share this with you nothing original this is something i picked up on the internet which i think makes very fascinating viewing as to the differences between equality equity reality justice just pause for a minute and just try to absorb what is given there this will give you a fair idea of the differences between these four concepts i think it's fascinating pictures can speak louder than a thousand words okay so now there's another interesting question ladies and gentlemen we're talking about um, can you have a reference of governing law of the contract which is not a national law so there's a very interesting question which came up in this case can the sharia can the islamic sharia be the governing law of a contract so in this case ladies and gentlemen i'll share the name of the case with you very shortly the arbitration clause or the governing law of the contract clause said this dispute shall be governed by the laws of england except to the extent of any conflict with islamic sharia which shall prevail so the question which arose is can islamic sharia be the governing law of a contract and the english courts said that yes this is a case sanghi polyesters having an indian connection and the international versus the international investor the 2000 2000 case which went to the english courts and the english courts upheld the choice of governing law of the contract which was sharia in this case and i did a bit of research to find out ladies and gentlemen um how could sharia be the governing law of the contract i this is what i found out i found out that the sharia beyond the rituals of worship also had a component which dealt with personal family and economic laws beyond and also per, uh, and penal laws so it had an element which also dealt with economic laws and perhaps this is perhaps this is one of the reasons why the english court um in sanghi polyesters decided that 
the Sharia could indeed be the governing law of the contract. Next, we come to another very interesting question. Can the Bible be a governing law of the contract? Very, very interesting question. Now, this is a clause where the parties agreed that the arbitrator shall apply the law of God found in the Old and New Testaments in considering the facts and determining the conventions being arbitrated. Very religious fellows. They want the law of God found in the Old and New Testament to be the governing law of the contract. Well, sadly, this, this, this matter did not go before a court of law, but this was something which, it's a clause which finds mention in Reisman Merton's book, International Commercial Arbitration Cases and Materials. So it'll be interesting to actually see how the courts would have decided this issue as to whether the Bible could have been the governing law of the contract. My guess is no. I'm of the view that Bible is more of a religious text and perhaps um, the court courts probably would not have upheld such a clause. Now here I have an example, ladies and gentlemen, of a badly drafted governing law of the contract clause. This is a classic example of how not to draft an arbitration, a governing law of the contract clause. The principles common to both English law and French law, and in the absence of such common principles, by such general principles of international trade law as have been applied by national and international tribunals. How do you give effect to such a clause, ladies and gentlemen? And mind you, this was a clause which found its way into a lot of contracts relating to one of the biggest infrastructure projects the world has ever seen. Can any of you tell me what was this, what was this infrastructure project? Please unmute yourself and answer this question. Can any of you take a guess? Rishita? Any of you can guess as to what large infrastructure project had such a clause? Here's another guess. France Metro. Sorry? All right. Well, this the infrastructure project was what is called the Euro Tunnel. The Euro Tunnel is a railway tunnel which is built under the sea in the English Channel, which separates UK and France. So this was this was a clause which was commonly used in a lot of these contracts relating to the construction of the Euro Tunnel. So. Sadly, and mind you, these are very sophisticated parties, you know, who had the, had, had the benefit of very good lawyers. It just goes to show that at times when parties look at drafting such clauses, many a times either they become overtly creative or not too much of thought is applied into how these clauses are drafted. So this is another takeaway, ladies and gentlemen, when you're drafting such clauses, Pay a lot of attention to how these clauses are drafted. Here is another example of a badly drafted governing law of the contract clause. And this was something which is very common in oil production sharing contracts. Just read this clause. It says, the common principles of the laws of England and the Russian Federation. And in default of such common principles, the laws of Alberta, Canada. Again, look at the effort which the lawyers would have to be put in when they are representing a case before an arbitrator. And also not to mention the effort which an arbitrator will have to go in understanding what is the substantive law of the contract and what principles to follow. So again, this is a classic example of a clause that you should avoid. <coughs> so ladies and gentlemen, 
We've seen the governing law of the contract. That's the first tier. Now let's go to the second tier of the legal matrix, which is the law of the arbitration seat. The law of the arbitration seat, ladies and gentlemen, is also technically called the Lex Arbitri or the Curial Law. So what exactly is the law of the arbitration seat? Now, before we look at the law of the arbitration seat, ladies and gentlemen, it would be very important for us to define the term seat of arbitration. What is the seat of arbitration? So here goes seat of arbitration. We must remember, ladies and gentlemen, that arbitration, although it is an alternative means of dispute resolution, an arbitration doesn't function in a vacuum. At every point in time, an arbitration needs to valid, it needs the validity and need, needs the recognition from an arbitration law and from the courts of the land in which the arbitration is conducted. So arbitration doesn't happen in a delocalized manner. It, every arbitration is rooted and anchored in a particular jurisdiction. So that primary legal jurisdiction in which an arbitration is anchored or rooted in is called the seat of arbitration or the place of arbitration or the situs of the arbitration. And the seat of arbitration, ladies and gentlemen, is a very, very important concept. So much so important that Redfern and Hunter in, in their book on international commercial arbitration. It's a very fascinating book, ladies and gentlemen. I would suggest you should, you should invest in this book. I would call it, I call it the Red Bible of uh, international commercial arbitration. Red Feynman Hunter is something um, the university should also invest in. It is the, in my view, the- As I said earlier, I said the chocolate is really warm and we need to cool it down. So then we take it nice and warm. Praveen, can you please mute your mic, please? Okay, thank you very much. So Redfern and Hunter, ladies and gentlemen, says that the seat of arbitration is so important that it is the center of gravity of an arbitration. And this is also something which has been reaffirmed by the Supreme Court of India in that landmark decision of Bharat Aluminium versus Kaiser Aluminium 2012 decision, better known as a Balco case, where the Supreme Court of India, a constitution bench, five judges, you know, um, said that, quoting Redfern and Hunter, said that the, cent the seat of arbitration is the center of gravity and everything in an arbitration revolves around the seat of arbitration. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, the seat of arbitration is very important because it gives leg legitimacy, legality, and also nationality to an arbitration. So what are these three, what are these three significant contributions of the seat of arbitration? Seat of arbitration is important because it, it sets the framework for the arbitration. It fixes the lex arbitrary. It fixes which law shall govern the procedural aspects of the conduct of the arbitration. Secondly, it decides which courts can have the supervisory jurisdiction of the arbitration. Now, the courts in India and also overseas have equated a seat of arbitration with an exclusive jurisdiction clause, what you find in litigation. So this is the second important significance of the seat of arbitration. And thirdly, ladies and gentlemen, the seat of arbitration also determines the nationality of the award. And nationality is very important, ladies and gentlemen, because, because of a convention, United Nations convention called the New York Convention. 
New York Convention, as many of you know, is the basis on which awards, that is the decision of an arbitrator, is enforced internationally. Okay, so the, these, so the, this, the, these are the three important basis or significance of the seat of arbitration. <laughs> Blessy, can I please request you to mute your mics? Please don't unmute your mics unless you ask to. Thank you very much. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, so these are the three important reasons why seat of arbitration is very, very important when you're looking at the process of arbitration. Now, what is the law of the seat of arbitration? The law of the seat of arbitration, ladies and gentlemen, is also called the governing law of the arbitration. Don't confuse this with the governing law of the contract. The governing law of the contract is also called the substantive law of the contract or the proper law of the contract. The law of the arbitration seat is called the governing law of the arbitration. The right technical term is lex arbitri. It's also called the law of the situs or the curial law. And at times also wrongly called the procedural law. I'll, I'll come to that as to why it is called wrongly called the procedural law, because there is the there is a possibility when you can have the interface between or you can have the a situation where you have a law of the seat of arbitration and the parties have also chosen another law to be the procedural law. How how will the procedure then be conducted when you have the law of the arbitration seat and also a party chosen procedural law. So that's very, very important. It's a very, very important and fascinating aspects of the interplay between the procedural law of the arbitration and the law of the arbitration seat. So let's look at the law of the arbitration seat first. Now the law of the arbitration seat, ladies and gentlemen, is, is not a choice. It automatically flows from the choice of a seat of arbitration. So when you choose a particular jurisdiction, as your seat of arbitration, the arbitration law of that jurisdiction automatically becomes the law of the arbitration seat. So to give you an example, if you have chosen Hong Kong as your seat of arbitration, then the law of the seat of arbitration cannot, it's not a matter of choice. The moment you choose the law of the seat of arbitration, then the arbitration laws of Hong Kong which you have chosen as your seat would automatically apply to the procedural aspects of your arbitration. So that is why I've said it is not a matter of choice. It automatically flows from the choice of the seat of arbitration. And there's a very interesting English case, ladies and gentlemen, the Peruvian insurance case, which talks about a two tier uh, or a two way um, traffic, a two way street between the choice of the seat of arbitration and the law of the seat of arbitration. So this is an important case, Naviera Amazonica Peruano versus Compania Internacional de Seguros del Peru. So here the court of appeal, ladies and gentlemen, in, in England said that the link between the law of the seat of arbitration or lex arbitri and the seat of arbitration is a two way street if the parties choose a particular state X as the seat of arbitration, the law of state X will be the law governing the arbitration procedure automatically. And by the same token, if the parties choose a procedural law of the state X as a Lex arbitrary, then the state X would be impliedly chosen as the seat of arbitration. So the, this Peruvian insurance case, ladies and gentlemen, the English Court of Appeal says that this link or this interface between the seat of arbitration and the law of the seat of arbitration is a two-way street, okay? So when you're looking at the law of the seat of arbitration, ladies and gentlemen, it's also important because the law of the arbitration seat determines certain very, very important aspects of an arbitration. It determines the arbitrability of disputes. It de determines the default appointment and challenge procedure in an arbitration. 
It determines the duties and powers of an arbitrator. It also very, very importantly determines what kind of assistance the court, the courts of the seat of arbitration can give to an arbitration. It determines on what basis you can challenge an award. It determines what powers the courts will have with respect to granting an injunction, which granting discovery, with, with giving assistance to taking of evidence. All these matters, ladies and gentlemen, depend on the choice of the seat of arbitration. And these are matters which are decided by the law of the seat of arbitration. And that is why it is extremely important to understand what is this law of the seat of arbitration and how is it chosen, okay? And also the law of the seat of arbitration is important, ladies and gentlemen, as I said earlier from the nationality of an award. Because in arbitration, as most of you would be aware, you can take an award from one jurisdiction and enforce it in another jurisdiction through a United Nations convention called the New York Convention of 1958. The correct technical term of this convention, ladies and gentlemen, is the United Nations Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. This is a convention of 1958, which originally had 40 countries who signed up to it in 1958 at a conference held in New York. And today, ladies and gentlemen, there are 166 countries which have signed the New York Convention. So this is, um, this is um, thanks to Norton Rose Fulbright, we have a pictorial insight into which countries have signed the New York Convention, which countries have not signed the New York Convention. All the countries in red are the countries which have not signed the New York Convention. And you will see that the large bulk of the countries around the world have actually signed the New York Convention. And the countries in gray. So see, India, India was one of the original signatories to the New York Convention way back in 1958. Now you will see that if you're looking at Asia, there are only four countries which have not signed up to the New York Convention, Iraq, Turkmenistan, North Korea, and Taiwan. Otherwise, it's pretty much Africa, which are the remaining countries which have not signed up the New York Convention. The New York Convention, ladies and gentlemen, is the most important convention in the field of international commercial arbitration. International commercial arbitration, as we know it today, cannot function without the New York Convention. International trade, as we know it, will, there will be difficulty for it to be facilitated without the New York Convention. And that is why one arbitration commentator compared the arbitration, the importance of the New York Convention. He said that, and I quote him, he said that the New York Convention is akin to the grease which lubricates international trade, unquote. So it's a very, very important convention. It says the importance of this is that you can take an award given by an arbitrator seated in India and enforce it against assets in 166 countries around the world. And seat of arbitration, ladies and gentlemen, is important because it determines the, it determines the nationality of an award. So for example, if your seat of arbitration is in North Korea, God forbid you have an arbitration with a seat in North Korea. North Korea is not a signatory to the New York Convention. So if your seat is in North Korea, then you will not get the benefit of the New York Convention if you want to enforce that award against assets of the judgment uh, debtor located in, in jurisdictions beyond North Korea. And that is why nationality is important and seat of arbitration determines the nationality of the arbitration award. So now, um, ladies and gentlemen, to choose the seat of arbitration, all you need to do is have one line in your arbitration clause. I'm also giving you, I'm also giving you drafting pointers, ladies and gentlemen. Please make a note of that. As I'm talking about these, as I'm, as I'm talking about these different um, tiers and levels of the legal matrix, I'm also giving you drafting pointers. And at the end of the, at the end of the class, you will see that if you were to collate all these drafting pointers, which are in red, you can have an automatic, you will have an automatic arbitration clause. Okay, so this is how you would draft 
or make a choice of a seat of arbitration in your contract. All right. So when you're looking at India, ladies and gentlemen, the Lex Arbitrary, when your seat of arbitration is in India, the Lex Arbitrary will be the Indian Arbitration and Conciliation Act. The Indian Arbitration and Conciliation Act is of 1996. It's based on the ancestral model law. And prior to the coming into force of the 1996 Indian Arbitration and Conciliation Act, ladies and gentlemen, there was not one law, but there were three laws relating to arbitration in India. Together, this constituted the um, you know, the, 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 the law of the seat of arbitration in India. You have the Arbitration Act of 1940, the Arbitration Protocol and Convention Act of 1937, and the Foreign Awards Recognition and Enforcement Act of 1961. In 1996, these three laws were consolidated and modernized into one unified statute called the Arbitration and Conciliation Act of 1996. And we've had a long tradition of arbitration in India, ladies and gentlemen. The first codified laws relating to arbitration can be traced back to the Bengal regulations of 1772. And of course, we've had a long tradition of arbitration in ADR, which can be, which can be traced back to the, our ancient epics. You will remember that Lord Krishna had acted as a mediator and an arbitrator between the Pandavas and the Kauravas in the Battle of Kurukshetra. It is also very very commonly said, jokingly, of course, that, that, um, that Lord Krishna, despite his best efforts, could not prevent the war. So the Battle of Kurukshetra was a classic example of the manifestation of a failed mediation or a failed arbitration. So, so we've had a long tradition of arbitration in India, ladies and gentlemen. It's only with the British Raj that we had codified laws. But otherwise, this tradition of arbitration in India can be traced back to ancient India. So from ancient India, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the Arbitration Act of 1996, which is the Lex Arbitrary when your seat of arbitration is in India. Now, quickly, if you were to look at the scheme of the Arbitration Act, very, very briefly, I just wanted to tell you, the Arbitration Act is divided into parts, chapters. Chapters are divided into sections. And then you have eight schedules at the very end of the act, just by way of illustration, nothing beyond that. Okay. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when you're looking at the seat of arbitration, you will commonly find that there is also a term called place of arbitration. What is the difference between seat of arbitration and place of arbitration? Well, to me, there is no difference. The place of arbitration and the seat of arbitration are synonymous concepts. They are concepts, they are terms which are used interchangeably. But the world over today, the term seat of arbitration is more commonly used rather than the place of arbitration. And why is the, is, is the seat preferred and not um, place? Because if you use the word place, there is the ability that it might be confused with another concept, which is called the venue or the location or the place of hearing of an arbitration. So that is why, because of this confusion between place of arbitration and the venue of an arbitration, the preference internationally today is to use the term seat of arbitration. And if at all you need to use the word place of arbitration, prefix the word place with legal place of arbitration so that there is no confusion with the other term, which is called the venue of arbitration. So let's see what is this difference between seat and place of arbitration on one hand and the venue of arbitration on the other. So seat of arbitration, ladies and gentlemen, is a legal construct. It's a legal concept, okay? The moment you have a choose a particular jurisdiction as your seat of arbitration, legal implications flow from the choice of that particular jurisdiction as your seat. Whereas venue, ladies and gentlemen, is, is a physical construct. The choice of a particular jurisdiction in most cases usually has no legal implications. That's the general rule. 
there are exceptions to that rule and i will come to those exceptional exceptional circumstances but generally the choice of a venue of a particular jurisdiction as the venue of an arbitration will not have any legal implications with flow out of it and this difference between place and venue of arbitration ladies and gentlemen has been i'll try to explain that uh, with an illustration of a singaporean case pt garuda indonesia versus bergen air which is a which is a which is a matter which went up right up to the singaporean court of appeal and uh, let us see what this case is now this was a case ladies and gentlemen which related to the aircraft on your screen this is a dc 1030 and this was a case ladies and gentlemen which involved a contract between pt garuda indonesia and bergen air now garuda indonesia as many of you might be aware is the national airline of indonesia it is the air india equivalent of of indonesia bergen air is a company based out of istanbul which owns an aircraft and is in the business of leasing aircraft to uh, airlines around the world so this was a contract between garuda indonesia and the belgian subsidiary of bergen air now the facts of this case are very interesting garuda indonesia got a contract from the government of indonesia to ferry hajj pilgrims from jakarta to jeddah uh in saudi arabia garuda indonesia did not have aircraft spare aircraft to uh, for the purposes of the hajj for the for the hajj pilgrimage so garuda indonesia decided to lease an aircraft from bergen air and um, so the contract was executed during the course of the contract ladies and gentlemen a dispute arose and the matter came to be referred to arbitration and uh, the arbitration had an icc arbitration clause icc rules of arbitration the seat of arbitration was jakarta indonesia the venue of arbitration was also jakarta indonesia and I, if i recollect correctly the substantive law of the contract was also indonesian law uh, some way in late 2001 they were internal disturbances in indonesia there were riots race riots in jakarta as a result of which the proceedings in the arbitration could not be conducted and the arbitrators in consultation with the parties decided to move the venue of arbitration from jakarta to adjoining singapore so only the venue of arbitration was shifted ladies and gentlemen the seat was not shifted the seat continued to be in jakarta indonesia an award came to be delivered in this arbitration award went against garuda indonesia garuda indonesia challenged the award in the singaporean high court matter went to the singaporean court of appeal and the court of appeal decided ladies and gentlemen that although the venue of arbitration the place of hearings of of the arbitration had shifted from jakarta to singapore there was no agreement between the parties to shift the seat of arbitration from jakarta to singapore so the seat continued to be in jakarta if the seat continued to be in jakarta then you have to challenge that award in the courts in jakarta you cannot come and challenge the award in the courts of the venue of arbitration so this is one of the very very important cases cited quite often and which brings out the importance of the this distinguishing uh, importance and the distinct and 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 the and the importance of this uh, dis, uh, you know of of the difference between these two concepts of seat and venue of arbitration so seat is so important because remember you can challenge an award you can make an application for setting aside an award only at the courts of the seat of arbitration you cannot do that at the place of the venue of the arbitration and this is a classic case 
which brings out that distinction between and the importance of making the right choice of seat of arbitration. So let's move on, ladies and gentlemen. Now, you've seen the difference between seat and venue. And um, this difference between seat and venue, you will find uh, it in the rules of most arbitral institutions. You will also find this, distinct, this distinction in the Indian Arbitration and Conciliation Act. The only slight difference in the Indian Arbitration and Conciliation Act, ladies and gentlemen, is that in the Indian Act, this, di this distinction is not very clearly spelt out expressly because the Indian Arbitration Act in section 20 uses the term place of arbitration. It does not use the term seat of arbitration. It does not use the term venue of arbitration. So therefore there was some confusion over the years, that confusion which has also been reflected with the greatest of respect to the Supreme Court in decisions of the Supreme Court. But this was finally clarified, ladies and gentlemen, in two decisions um, in the Bharat aluminum case, the Balco decision of 2012, and also in the more recent Indus Mobile Distribution versus Data Wind Innovation case of 2017. Now, these were two cases where the Supreme Court clearly said in, in the context of Section 20, when place is venue and when place is seat. To make it much easier for you, this is what I've, I've, I've put it together here. So the Supreme Court in this two decisions said that the word place, which is used in subsection one and subsection two of section 20 is actually a reference to the concept of seat of arbitration. And the use of the term place of arbitration in section 20 subsection three is a reference to venue of arbitration. So post these two decisions, ladies and gentlemen, in my view, an express letter of the law, which had caused confusion now has been clarified. So now in my view, there is no need for anybody to be confused as to which subsection of 20 makes a reference to seat, which subsection makes a reference to venue because the, this, this matter has now been clarified by the Supreme Court of India in not one, but in two decisions and also by a five judge constitution bench of the Supreme Court of India in the Balco, in Balco decision. Okay, so that is one very important um, factor which I wanted to draw to your attention. Now, there are a few other things I had said, ladies and gentlemen, if you remember, I had said that the general rule is that the seat and venue are not synonymous concepts and they cannot be used interchangeably. Venue generally is a, it, it does not have legal implications, but there are certain exceptions, certain exceptional cases wherein the venue will be regarded to be the seat of arbitration. And what are those exceptional circumstances? This is what I'm very quickly gonna look into ladies and gentlemen. So the first case, ladies and gentlemen, where in the, I would say in the Indian context, um, where the venue of the arbitration was decided to be the seat of arbitration is this case Shashwa versus Sharma. So venue in this case was held to be the seat of arbitration because the parties had not expressly made a choice of seat of arbitration in the contract. So if you see the contract, the arbitration clause, it made a provision for Indian governing law of the contract it said ICC arbitration rules, and it just said venue of the arbitration shall be London, United Kingdom. But it was silent as to the seat of arbitration. So the, it, now this is not an Indian case, but it is important in an Indian case because this case has formed the basis of the rule that it's called the Shashwa rule or the Shashwa principle, we'll come to that later. But let's look at the English judgment first. So in this case, ladies and gentlemen, seat of arbitration was not chosen by the parties. Venue was chosen. Venue was chosen to be London. The English High Court, Lord Justice Cook said, although venue is not synonymous with seat, the clause provided sufficient evidence to satisfy the court that London was indeed the juridical seat of arbitration. 
And then it went on to lay down what is called the Shashwa principle, which has been followed in a number of decisions by the Supreme Court of India. It said that where there is a designation of the arbitration venue as London, no designation of an alternative place as a seat of arbitration, combined with a supranatural supranational body of rules and no other significant contrary indicia. If these four conditions are present, he's, the judge says, the inexorable conclusion is to my mind that London is the juridical seat and English law, the cur curial law of arbitration. And this Shashwa principle, ladies and gentlemen, was quoted with approval in the Balcourt decision, five judge bench, Supreme Court 2012, also in the two judge bench 2014, NRCon versus NRCon case, also quoted in Roger Shashwa versus Mukesh Sharma, two judge bench, and also quoted in BGS Soma versus NHPC. So these were four cases. I've just given you an illustrative list of the more important cases where the Shashwa principle was upheld by the Supreme Court of India. And the Supreme Court said that, um, you know, if these three conditions are present, then venue of arbitration will be considered to be the seat of arbitration. Given the paucity of time, I'm not going to go through a lot of cases, but this is a very important case where the Shashwa principle was repeated and reiterated in a decision given by um, Justice Rowington Nariman, where he said that um, whenever there's a designation of a place of arbitration in an arbitration clause as being the venue of arbitration, the expression arbitration proceedings would make it clear that the venue is a really the seat of arbitration. And this coupled with there being no significant contrary in this year, the venue is not merely a venue and, and, and it would also be the seat of arbitration. So just remember this, ladies and gentlemen, there are certain circumstances where the venue of arbitration would be considered to be its seat when the seat has not been expressly chosen by the two parties. And the latest decision of the Supreme Court is BGS, SGS, SOMA versus National Hydropower Corporation, NHPC. Um, let's quickly look at another aspect, ladies and gentlemen, um, which I've chosen, which I, which I alluded to earlier. I talked about the ability of there being the theoretical possibility of having one jurisdiction as the seat of arbitration, as the which will determine the the uh, you know which will determine the law of the arbitration seat, and parties choosing another law to be the procedural law of the arbitration. So the question, ladies and gentlemen, is: Can you choose a procedural law which is different from the law of the seat of arbitration? We had seen earlier that when you choose a particular jurisdiction as your seat of arbitration, the arbitration law of that particular jurisdiction automatically applies to the, automatically becomes the, the law of the seat of arbitration. That would govern all the procedural aspects of your arbitration. So the question is now, so assume now, let's look at an example. You have chosen Singapore as your seat of arbitration. The moment you choose Singapore is your seat of arbitration. The Singaporean Arbitration Act becomes your lex arbitri or the law of the law of the seat. Now, in the contract, you are saying that the seat of arbitration shall be Singapore, but the arbitration shall be governed by the Indian Arbitration and Conciliation Act. Can you do that? That's the question. And the answer to this. The short answer to this is, ladies and gentlemen, theoretically and legally, this is possible, but this is rarely done and not advised. And see what Redfern and Hunter had to say on this. They're saying that international arbitration is complicated enough without such flights of fancy. So why get into this complication? So while it's theoretically possible, please don't endeavor to go down that line. All right, let's now move on, ladies and gentlemen. Um, can you have a floating seat of arbitration? 
Now, this was a question which came up in this very interesting case, Star Shipping versus China National Foreign Trade Transportation. The clause said, any dispute arising under the charter is to be referred to arbitration in Beijing or London in the defendant's option. Is this a valid clause? The English Court of Appeal said, yes, it is a valid clause, but from a practical aspect, I said no. stay away from such clauses. And you might want to have just one jurisdiction as your seat of arbitration. And again, here, ladies and gentlemen, ah! let me make it, uh, let me, through an example, show you how a clause was very badly drafted with respect to the seat of arbitration. Now, this is not a figment of my imagination. This is a real life case. Uh, it's a reported decision, English decision, Lovelock versus Exportless. The clause says, any dispute- <laughs> Oh, bring it, Daddy. Oh, 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 oh. Any dispute should be referred to arbitration. And any other dispute should be referred. I'm sorry about that. My mind was slightly diverted. Uh, so this clause says any dispute should be referred to arbitration in London and that any other dispute should be referred to arbitration in Moscow. How do you give effect to such a clause? It's a very interesting clause. How do you decide what dispute is any dispute and what dispute is any other dispute? Just read the clause once again. It says, any dispute to be referred to arbitration in London and any other dispute should be referred to arbitration in Moscow. How do you give effect to such a clause? This is an example of a very badly drafted seat of arbitration clause. And see what Lord Denning, master of rules, had to say in this case. He says, and I quote Lord Denning, I'm forced to the conclusion that the clause is uncertain, that the court cannot give effect to it. It is beyond the wit of man, or at any rate, beyond my wit to say which dispute comes within which part of the clause. So ladies and gentlemen, this is why you need to pay a lot of attention into what goes into your arbitration clauses. Now well, let's quickly look, given the paucity of time, let's quickly look into the importance of the law of the arbitration agreement. What exactly is the law of the arbitration agreement? Now, there's a very fascinating area, Gary Bond, Again, one of the leading commentators on arbitration, international commercial arbitration, in his book writes, this topic, that is the law of the arbitration agreement, has given rise to extensive commentary and also equally extensive confusion. So what is the law of the arbitration agreement? So we all know, ladies and gentlemen, Arbitration emanates from the consent of the two parties. The consent of the two parties to go to arbitration is contained in an arbitration agreement. An arbitration agreement can, can take three avatars. It can be an arbitration clause in a contract, something like this. This is a classic example of an arbitration clause in a contract, or it can be a separate agreement, which you call a submission agreement or it could be incorporation into a contract by reference, ladies and gentlemen, which happens very common in a lot of, in a lot of government contracts where you have one document, which is called the general conditions of contract. Like for example, government departments like the Central Public Works Department, Ministry of Railways, Ministry of Defense, all have 200, 300 pages books, which are called the GCC or the general conditions of contract. That has got all the standard conditions of contract including the arbitration clause. And when the contract is finally signed between the two parties, it is usually the purchase order, the work order, the final contract is usually a two or three page document. In that document, in that contract document, there is no arbitration clause, but there will only be one line where a reference is made to the general conditions of contract. So this is the third avatar which an arbitration agreement can take. And what is important 
is that ladies and gentlemen, all these forms or avatars of arbitration agreement have to be in writing. Whilst you can have a oral contract, remember that an arbitration agreement, as per Section Seven of the Arbitration Act, always has to be in writing. That is the in writing requirement contained in most arbitration statutes around the world. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we've seen the avatars which an arbitration agreement takes, and the law of the arbitration agreement is very important, ladies and gentlemen, because of this important doctrine or a presumption called the separability doctrine and what is the separability doctrine the separability the separability doctrine is also called the doctrine of autonomy it was enunciated by the house of lords in this case hamans versus darwin in 1942 so this doctrine says that an arbitration clause is such an important clause an arbitration agreement is such an important agreement or a clause in a contract that it has an independent and autonomous and separate existence, which is apart from the wider contract in which it resides. So it has got such an important status that it can survive the termination of the wider contract. So the contract in which you have an arbitration clause may come to an end, but the separability doctrine says that just because a contract has come to an end, that does not mean that the arbitration clause ceases to exist. And that is why in this case, Union of India versus McDonald Douglas Corporation, the court said that an arbitration clause in a commercial contract is an agreement inside an agreement. And this concept of separability Although it was enunciated by the House of Lords in Hamans versus David, it has been granted statutory recognition in Section 16A of the Indian Arbitration and Conciliation Act. So it is no longer a foreign concept. It finds a safe abode in Section 16, subsection 1, clauses A and B of the Indian Arbitration and Conciliation Act. And because of this independent and autonomous existence, ladies and gentlemen, in an international commercial contract, in a, uh, you, can, you can have a separate law to govern your arbitration agreement. And what is the significance of this arbitration agreement? This is important, ladies and gentlemen, for the following reasons. The existence of an arbitration clause is decided by this law. The formal validity, jurisdiction, interpretation, termination, capacity of parties, all these issues are decided by the law of the arbitration agreement. And in the Indian context, it's very important because one of the grounds on which you can set aside an award under section 34, and in which you can also refuse enforcement of a foreign award under section 48, is that the arbitration agreement is not valid under the law to which the parties have subjected it to. So this is the significance of the uh, law of the arbitration agreement. And what are the methods to determine this test? Very two very simple methods. The first method is in keeping with the fundamental principle of party autonomy, parties can make an express designation of the law of the arbitration agreement. If they don't do that, then the, this, then the tribunal will have to decide or the courts might have to decide what is the law of the arbitration agreement. And when deciding this, ladies and gentlemen, there is no universally accepted method. The law of the arbitration agreement can either be the law underlying the contract or the substantive law of the contract, or it can be the law of the seat of arbitration or lex arbitrary. It can either be any of the two. So what is the position in India when parties have not expressly chosen the law of the arbitration agreement what would be the what would be this law it could either be the law of the law the substantive law of the contract or it could be the law of the seat of arbitration so let us look at the a few case law uh, given the paucity of time i'm not going to be looking at the english position but the english position ladies and gentlemen is contained in this case called um, sul america nacional de seguros versus nsa engineeria uh, it's a brazil brazilian case 
which went to the English Court of Appeal, where there was a three-stage test which was laid down. Not important for today's um, lecture, but let's quickly look at the Indian context. In the Indian context, the law has been laid down by this very important case of the Supreme Court in NTPC, National Thermal Power Corporation versus Singer. So in this case, ladies and gentlemen, the Supreme Court has held down, laid down three rules. Rule one, number one, in the absence of express choice of the law of the arbitration agreement, the choice of the proper law of the contract will also govern the arbitration clause. Second, it says, now this confuses things a little bit. However, in exceptional circumstances, even if the proper law of the contract is chosen, such may not be the law of the arbitration agreement where the agreement is silent. And rule three, when neither the proper law of the contract nor the proper law of the arbitration agreement is chosen, it would be presumed that the law of the arbitration agreement would be the law of the seat of arbitration. And these three rules, ladies and gentlemen, this position stated in NTPC versus Singer was cited with approval and affirmed in a 1998 decision of the Supreme Court of India in Sumitomo versus ONGC. And for you to have this in your clause, in your, con in your, in your arbitration clause, all you need to have is one line which says that the law governing the arbitration agreement shall be the laws of so-and-so jurisdiction. That's all you need to do to have it in your arbitration clause. And now very quickly, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to wind up this in the next five minutes, given we're really short of time. The last tier is the arbitration or the procedural rules of the arbitration. What is, what is, what is this? What are the procedural rules of an arbitration? Now, when you're looking at the process of arbitration, ladies and gentlemen, the procedural rules of an arbitration relate to the processes and mechanisms of arbitration. And when you're looking at the processes and mechanisms of arbitration, party autonomy rules out here. If you look at section 19 of the Indian Arbitration and Conciliation Act, section 19, subsection two says that parties are free to agree on the procedure to be followed by the arbitral tribunal in conducting its proceedings. And subsection three says that failing any agreement by the parties, the arbitral tribunal may conduct the proceedings in the manner it considers appropriate. So parties are given the first choice to decide what the procedural rules of your arbitration would be. If they don't do that, then the tribunal will step in and decide the procedure. So when you're looking at procedure of arbitration, ladies and gentlemen, we've always seen that arbitration is conducted in two modes ad hoc arbitration and institutional arbitration, okay? We've seen the definition of what is ad hoc and arbitration, ad hoc and institutional arbitration in ad hoc and which is better. Now, this is the something we've not, we've not looked into. Ad hoc or institutional arbitration, which is better? This is what I believe, ladies and gentlemen. I've taken a little bit of inspiration from Nani Palkiwala and his book, We the Nation, The Lost Decades. Which is better, ad hoc or institutional arbitration? Ad hoc arbitration is like a Rolls Royce of 1920s vintage, stately because it's dominated by retired judges. With the greatest of respect to our retired judges, please don't take any offense to that. High fuel consumption, arbitrators' fees are decided on the number of sittings, and it takes an, almost an eternity for completion. Whereas institutional arbitration, ladies and other uh, gentlemen, on the other hand, could be likened to a shiny new Honda Accord. It will take you to the same destination with greater speed, higher efficiency, and in the Indian context with dramatically less fuel consumption. So I rest my case, ladies and gentlemen, as to which is better, ad hoc or institutional arbitration. And this also appears to be the way forward because the government of India today, ladies and gentlemen, is pushing for institutional arbitration. So much so, um, so much so that uh, so much so that the government has decided that this will be a priority. Promoting institutional arbitration will be a priority of the government of India. This is a policy statement made by the made by the 
Prime Minister of India himself. So, so when you're looking at procedural rules, ladies and gentlemen, um, when you're looking at procedural rules, you basically, uh, when you're looking at procedural rules, ladies and gentlemen, you, I, there is something which is wrong, I think with my, Okay, pitfalls of technology. So when you're looking at procedural rules, ladies and gentlemen, parties can either choose between ad hoc arbitration or they can use choose a institutional arbitration. So they essentially have an option to adopt the rules of an institution, to use ad hoc rules, or they can use tailor-made rules for a particular dispute. So what you need to, the bottom line that you need to keep in mind is that you should not confuse the procedural rules of an arbitration with the procedural law of an arbitration or the law of the seat of arbitration, okay? Remember that you have the law of the seat of arbitration, which determines certain procedural aspects of the arbitration. And then you have the procedural rules of an arbitration, which determine the nitty gritties of procedure. Who shall do what, when, how much is to be done by whom and all of that is, the, is, is, is taken care of by the procedural rules of the arbitration. Uh, there is something wrong which is happening with this, ladies and gentlemen. Somebody has taken control of my slides, unfortunately. Okay, so when we're looking at this ladies, so we need to remember ladies and gentlemen that, um, sorry for this technical difficulty. I don't know. It is, somebody is, has taken control of my screen, sadly. Um, pitfalls of technology. So when we're looking at procedural rules, ladies and gentlemen, and procedural law or the law of the seat of arbitration, there might be a slight overlap between the two. But if there is an overlap, what happens? What happens when, ladies and gentlemen, that is something that you need to uh, remember out here. Um, again, yes, I think, uh, okay. There is some difficulty somebody has taken over. Okay, let's forget this slides on the screen. If there is a difference between the procedural law of the arbitration, ladies and gentlemen, and the procedural rules of an arbitration, you must remember that the procedural law of an arbitration has got uh, mandatory provisions and it's got non-mandatory provisions. For example, if you look at the Arbitration and Conciliation Act, the Arbitration and Conciliation Act has got certain provisions which are mandatory provisions and certain other provisions which are non-mandatory provisions. So if there is a conflict between the procedural rules and a mandatory provision of the Arbitration and Conciliation Act, the mandatory provision of the Arbitration and Conciliation Act overrides the procedural rules. But if there is a conflict between the non-mandatory provisions of the Arbitration and Conciliation Act and the procedural rules of an arbitration, then the procedural rules of an arbitration will take over or overrule the principles laid down in the non-mandatory provisions of the Arbitration Act. So this is how you would reconcile, ladies and gentlemen, a conflict between the procedural rules of an arbitration and the uh, and, and 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 the procedural uh, law of an arbitration. Okay, so on that note, ladies and gentlemen, I think I've given you a good insight. Uh, notwithstanding the technical problems, um, I hope I've given you a good insight into what I call the arbitration matrix. So um, if there are any questions, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'll be very happy to take up questions. Um... Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. It was a very precise and relevant presentation. And I'm sure everyone in this session has taken this as an opportunity to gain adequate knowledge regarding the legal matrix of arbitration and much more. Thank you for explaining us the difference between seat of arbitration and venue of arbitration. As students, we were so confused about it. And now you have clearly explained it to us, sir.
This guest lecture of yours would have inspired many who have witnessed it so far and include me as well. I thank you, sir, for making us understand this topic so crisp and clear with interesting PPTs. Now, the floor is open for the question answer session and I request you all to kindly put your questions in the chat box. Please put your questions in the chat box if you have any. I will, I will take it that uh, I've been successful in explaining and demystifying the concepts relating to the legal matrix of international commercial arbitration and everybody is uh, crystal clear about these four levels or tiers of laws and rules that apply to arbitration. Thank you so much, you know, for your patience. I do understand that uh, this has gone longer than what it should have, um, but it's a fascinating topic. International commercial arbitration is so fascinating because of the interplay between different laws, different nationalities, um, you know, and in that way, uh, domestic arbitration will always be seen as a poor cousin of international commercial arbitration. <laughs> And it's also a very, very interesting area of the law for you to be specializing in. Uh, so if you don't mind, we have a question from Kandan. Yes, Kandan. Yeah, uh, so his question is, uh, what are the prerequisites that a law graduate should have to enter into the field of arbitration? Well, um, prerequisites, you, you learn on the job. If you can have a solid theoretical understanding of arbitration when you are at law school. In the five years or three years of law school, that is excellent. But the practicalities of procedure, you will learn only on the job. So if I were to advise a law student on how to get into arbitration, so you must remember first things first, that arbitration is only a means of resolving disputes. So in the initial years of your career, your focus should be on being a dispute resolution practitioner. I would not advise anybody to specialize in arbitration right from day one. I would say that in the first years of your, in, in a career as a lawyer, look at special, look at being a generalist dispute resolution lawyer. Know how the court system functions, because remember, Although arbitration is an alternative means of dispute resolution, arbitration doesn't function in a vacuum. At every point in time, you will need to go to a court of law for appointment of an arbitrator, for challenging an award, for assistance, for a lot of things. So unless you understand how the court system functions, it'll be very difficult for you to, you know, to, to be a good arbitration practitioner. That's why I would say first few years, just if you if you've decided between you know the first uh, you know the first question as to do you want to be a transactional lawyer or do you want to be a dispute resolution lawyer if you've decided you want to be a dispute resolution lawyer do not specialize in arbitration at the from the day go try to be working with a law firm or a lawyer who does both who does arbitration as well as does normal litigation work and after having gained substantial experience in the general dynamics and dialectics of dispute resolution practice. If you still want, and you still think you want to be a specialist arbitration practitioner, that is the time then you can probably join a senior or a law firm or try to develop a practice in the field of arbitration. That is how I would advise you to get into the field of arbitration. And at that point in time, three years, four years, five years down the line after having got that initial experience, that probably might be a good time for you to also see whether you want to do a specialized arbitration LLM so that you can 
combine the practicalities of the law that you've been exposed to until now with a refreshed and specialized insight into the theory of the law once again so that's what i would advise for anybody that would be my advice to anybody wanting to get into the field of in, into the field of arbitration and this is from an indian perspective i hope that clarifies yes sir thank you sir so we have one more question from priya darshini um, what are the differences in rules when it comes to international commercial arbitration and interstate arbitration well international commercial arbitration we've seen what are the rules which apply but if you're looking at interstate arbitration now interstate arbitration let's look at a classic example of um, of of the the kishanganga arbitration between india and pakistan that was a state to state arbitration which arose out of the alleged breach of the indus water treaty by india so the substantive law of the contract there was the treaty between india and pakistan so what is the substantive law of the contract in international commercial arbitration there would be the the treaty and the principles of public international law coupled with the principles of public international law 